I think we can start. So good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, an honor and great pleasure to have uh, Professor Rufo with us today as our special speaker of our uh, department for Lofia. And uh, um, he's currently the director of the Cavan Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics of the Peking University where he's the university chair professor. He has a brilliant career. So he was educated at the Harvard University. And uh, after that, he got his uh, uh, PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. And after that, he was uh, one of the few that was uh, immediately <laughs> hired as an astronomer at the Carnegie uh, Observatory. And, uh, and after that, uh, he, he was in charge uh, of uh, of the astronomy in the inside of, uh, uh, of China and of the Asian part of our world. And uh, he has been uh, as uh, director of this important institute for the last uh, 20 years. He's uh, one of the most uh, known uh, observational astronomer, uh, multi-wavelength observational astronomer, studying the evolution of galaxies mm -hmm. and focusing on galaxy nuclei and studying the formation and evolution of supermassive black holes in quiescent and active galaxies and trying to understand the coevolution or not between black holes and the host galaxies. So it's a really great pleasure to give you the floor and we are really excited about what you're going to tell us on black holes and their galaxies. Thank you. I am absolutely delighted uh, to be in this historic place. Albio just reminded me the city walls are more than 700 years old. Uh, even if uh, Galileo did not uh, observe that the tower was here, uh, contrary to popular legend, uh, I still feel the weight of history uh, uh, this afternoon. What a beautiful city. I've been to Padova just one time. Uh, 12 years ago, when Giampaolo Giotto uh, organized a meeting on global clusters, and I was trying to learn about global clusters, uh, but I didn't come here. It was some other place. Uh, it's a lovely historic uh, campus. Um, but uh, the greatest fun for me today so far is uh, talking to many people, uh, both old friends and new, and uh, uh, seeing many uh, friendly faces from Albio to Bianca, uh, Paolo, etc. Um, I want to give you a grand tour uh, of the history of how black holes um, are connected intimately to the evolution and perhaps even formation, if I should dare say so at the end of my talk, of galaxy. Originally, I was going to give the standard talk to talk about how we discover supermassive black holes with HST, the sort of co-evolution, AGNT back, but I could not help myself in the last month um, by learning the truly um, breathtaking discoveries that we made with JWST. So I've never given this talk before. I'll give you some uh, insights into what's happening and share some private thoughts. They're not published. Okay. So let's begin at the very beginning. Um, literally, the surface of last scattering. This is a baby picture of the universe, the cosmic microwave background. We all know that the universe was incredibly homogeneous to one part in 100,000. Um, a grand challenge in uh, modern astrophysics is to understand how the universe went from this initially uh, smooth state to the highly inhomogeneous state that we see today, which is full of uh, galaxies of what the variants have condensed into late stars. Uh, because um, uh, light has a finite speed. When we look at a picture like this, we're really looking back in time. This gives us the uh, full archaeological record of the evolution, formation evolution of galaxies, uh, and I'll describe black holes. Uh, of course, this is a picture from the James Webb Space Telescope launched a couple of years ago. Um, now, this picture um, records uh, uh, the energy from thermonuclear uh, reactions inside stars. 
If I show you the same part of the sky, but now in hard X rays from 2 to 10 kV, what you're seeing here is not the emission from uh, stars, uh, but from accretion onto supermassive black holes coming from objects we call active galactic nuclei or more historically quasars. We've known since the 1960s that quasars derive their energy not from uh, the PP chain inside the sun, but rather from the conversion of gravitational potential energy uh, to heat uh, uh, deep in the gravitational potential wells around very massive objects uh, that later became called uh, supermassive black holes. Uh, essentially, you take the gravitational potential energy uh, uh, and you convert it uh, into, into, into very high energy radiation, uh, mostly in the ultraviolet, X rays, uh, even gamma rays, um, and even. Uh, um, Cosmic rays, as I'll describe in a moment. Now, this picture really began uh, already 60 years ago with the discovery, or rather, the identification of quasars by Martin Schmidt working at the Palmer Observatory uh, in Pasadena. What Schmidt became very famous in the cover of Time magazine is to figure out that 3C273, this quasi stellar object, this point like source, actually comes from uh, none other than uh, a source of radiation that's very hot. If you can see the spectrum there rises towards the ultraviolet, towards the blue, so it has a hot continuum. And on top of it are these strong emission lines. What you're seeing there, students should recognize, of course, is the hydrogen bomber recombination lines, H alpha, beta, gamma, etc. Uh, those lines are photoionized, comes from gas, which is photoionized, and then uh, by the continuum, the hot continuum, and then recombines to produce the recombination lines. Besides being very strong, you see that the lines are very fat, they're very wide, right? And that's because of the Doppler motions of the gas. The gas is not standing still, it's moving around some uh, 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 very massive object. That's why it has uh, line widths of several thousand, maybe even 10,000 uh, kilometers per second. Uh, so, this is keep in mind this picture, uh, rather, the spectrum of a quasar, it'll come back again and again later in the talk. Now, quasars, um, uh, were active not today, they were active in the universe was very young, about 10 billion years ago, between redshifts of two to three, was the peak of the uh, quasar uh, uh, space density. Um, by today, by redshift zero, uh, these quasars have basically become dormant. The reason is that most of the cold gas in the universe has been used up. So, star formation has subsided, accretion of the black hole has subsided. Uh, and we expect, if this picture is correct, that quasars come from the accretion of the supermassive black holes that the centers of nearby giant galaxies should have dormant or quiescent uh, 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 supermassive black holes in their center. Is this correct or not? Well, let's start with the Milky Way, the galaxy closest to us. This is a, simply an artist's rendition of what the Milky Way looks like. Of course, we can't see it in this viewpoint because we are lying in the plane of the Milky Way, which is very inconvenient because the line of sight to the black center is obscured by dust because of our dark uh, absorption uh, dust lanes. To penetrate to the center, you want to go to a longer wavelength, uh, like the near infrared, the galaxy is more transparent. You zoom into the very center and use the best technology available to sharpen the images, to remove the turbulence coming from the atmosphere, to improve uh, the image quality by adaptive optics. Uh, it's a technique that can correct for the for the for the steering effects of the of the of the atmosphere. Uh, two primary facilities that have been involved: the Keck ten meter telescopes in Hawaii and the ESO uh, uh, the European Southern Observatory, a very uh, large telescope, the VLT. You use powerful sodium lasers, 22, 25 watts, to fire these artificial stars to the, uh, the atmosphere. It bounces back. You correct uh, for the uh, aberrations uh, by performing the, the mirror. Uh, you get very sharp images. And you take pictures of that tiny patch of the sky uh, again and again and again, uh, to be more exact, for about 25 years. Okay, So two teams of astronomers have been taking pictures of this tiny patch. This patch shown here is much, much less than one second of arc. Uh, it's about uh, three light months in diameter. 
And what you'll notice is that the stars they're moving, but they're moving uh, in uh, elliptical orbits according to Kepler's law. The most exciting uh, object is this so-called S2 star, the very bright one near the center. Uh, it's actually moving around with a velocity of about 2,000 kilometers per second. The distance of closest approach to the center, which is not visible, we just put a, a white marker there to indicate uh, where, 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 where it seems to be. Um, the distance of closest approach is less than one light week. So now I just told you the velocity, 2,000 kilometers per second, distance of closest approach is one light week. Everyone uh, in this room can work out the enclosed mass, that's from the uh, uh, law. Uh, it's a uh, 4 million solar masses. Now that's very impressive uh, uh, because it's coming from an object which is basically invisible, except for a little bit of radiation in the radio, a little bit of radiation in the hard X-rays, maybe gamma rays, okay? There's basically no optical or infrared light. Four million solar masses sounds very impressive, but you should think of something that's even more fundamental, which is the mass density. So four million solar masses inside a radius of a light week. It's 10 to the 13 solar masses per cubic light year. At these distances, it's possible to show that you cannot have any alternative except a single collapse object. Because if there were a cluster of dark things like brown dwarfs or you know, chairs or master students or whatever, <laughs> you would evaporate over a time scale much shorter than the Hubble time or, or, or collapse. And so you have no choice but to basically have a single uh, 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 object. We might as well call it a black hole. And for this work, Andrea Gez. Uh, Reinhard Genzel uh, for the observational work and uh, Roger Penrose for the uh, theoretical underpinnings received the 21 B Nobel Prize in Physics. Well, this is very exciting. You tell this to the media, the Nobel Prize, but this is one object. We need statistics to turn this into a, 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 a broader science. Most of the statistics came from uh, observations of other galaxies. Uh, using the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope is not big, it's only 2.3 meters. But because it's above the Earth's atmosphere, it doesn't have this you know, uh, uh, inconvenience of the, of the turbulence of the atmosphere, no scene. So you can achieve a, a spatial resolution uh, uh, of uh, 0.1 arc seconds. Uh, um, and you can therefore um, uh, measure um, the rotation as a function of radius. Right? This is how we uh, get the mass, just like we did for the galactic center. It's the same thing, but we're not measuring individual stars. We're measuring the collective uh, velocity of, of lots and lots of stars along the line of sight. And just like in the Milky Way, suppose we didn't know the mass of the sun. What is m? If I told you uh, the, the orbital velocity of the planets, and we know the location of the planets, you can fit this curve um, uh, and uh, solve for m. At one solar mass. Well, it's the same trick with Hubble Space Telescope. We want to know M in the center of the galaxy, so we use the Doppler shifts of uh, uh, collections of tracer particles to measure this rotation curve. This was one of the primary science uh, uh, targets, uh, goals of the Hubble Space Telescope, besides the uh, Hubble B project. And uh, I was very lucky to be involved in this from the very outset, a uh, uh, team. Uh, called the, the, the Nuker team uh, involving uh, uh, John Cormandy, Scott Tremaine, uh, Sandy Faber, uh, Doug Richstone, Alan Dresser, et cetera. Because um, I got my PhD in 1995, and they fixed the Hubble Space Telescope's aberrated optics in 1994. Uh, so we launched a major campaign over many years, uh, hundreds and hundreds of orbits to uh, search for and uh, hopefully measure uh, platform masses, and we did. Um, this is one of the first observations, M84. It's a giant uh, elliptical galaxy. We use the H-alpha line. Uh, remember H-alpha, the recombination line of hydrogen. And what is shown here is a rotation curve. Okay, so the Doppler shift on the x-axis, right? Blue shift, red shift is a function of distance from the center. And this is a classic signature, this zigzag pattern of an edge-on, nearly edge-on, rapidly rotating this, coming towards you, going away from you. Um, you can, again, very easily work out the enclosed mass. It's one billion solar masses, one billion, not forming it, one billion. And it's essentially totally dark. 
we see light, but it's coming from the stars in the galaxy. After you subtract the contribution from the stars, uh, effectively, what's left over is, is because of extremely large uh, so-called mass to light ratio. Uh, we think that's coming from, from a supermassive black hole. So this is one of the techniques we use H-alpha. But not all galaxies have H-alpha. Okay, so only some do. So, but all galaxies have stars, especially when they have a bulge. So for the vast majority of the, of the, of the galaxies we survey, we use the stellar kinematics. Once we measure the rotation curve on the bottom there and the also dispersion curve on the top, um, it's slightly more complicated, but essentially the same using Pepper's law. Okay, you can work out essentially in closed mass. And after just one or two or three years, we already discover something really unexpected. Every single galaxy that we observe had a black hole. Every single one. Not a single non-detection. This exceeded our wildest expectation that we were hoping we would find uh, some cases, but we didn't know that we'd find it every galaxy that had a bulge. It's as if every peach has a pit, right? Every bulge, every galaxy in the very center has, has this, 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 this thing, this massive compact dark object that we think is a black hole. Let me give you a cute update. One of the early galaxies we looked, looked at was, was M87. Classic giant liquid in the vertical cluster. Okay. Um, and from HSD uh, uh, analysis, we concluded it had a 6.2 times 10 to the 9 solar mass uh, black hole of 6 billion solar masses. Um, a recent update comes from the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, this is coming from radio astronomers working in a millimeter, uh, even sub millimeter wavelengths, but we use the diameter of the Earth to achieve the maximum possible resolution. We all know that the Resolution of a telescope is lambda divided by d. So if you want the resolution to be small, you decrease lambda or the high frequencies, so you go to 200, 300 gigahertz. And you make d as big as possible from the North Pole to the South Pole, well, from Greenland to the South Pole. Okay, in the future, people want to put a satellite in space to increase the baseline. Anyway, uh, you get a uh, very, very high resolution. Uh, high enough, in fact, to take an image of the shadow of the black hole. What is shown here is the photons that are bending around something that's dark. You think that's the black hole, right? This, this, this gravitational lensing that's bending the, the surrounding light to form this, this, this ring. Um, and the radius of, of, this, of, this, of this hole uh, is closely related to the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole, which is linearly. Uh, Related to the mass of the black hole. Um, what is the mass? It's 6.4 times 10 to the 9 solar masses. Pretty nice, okay? Completely independent, uh, 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 independent verification of the HSD uh, results. Okay, in 1998, by the time we had enough statistics, uh, sort of like 40, 50 objects, we start to make Correlations. That's what astronomers do and scientists do. Right? We plotted the mass of the black hole on the y-axis. We were stunned to realize that they follow a linear relationship with the stellar mass of the bulge of the galaxy. Uh, it's only a tiny fraction, half a percent to be exact. Okay, 0.5 percent. But it's an almost linear correlation. The more massive the bulge, like M87, you have a billion solar mass black hole. The Milky Way, much smaller bulge, uh, 4 million solar mass black hole, and so on and so forth. Uh, this uh, uh, became famous, uh, people called it the Magorian relation, uh, after the first author, John Magorian. Two years later, we published a result that became even more widely publicized, called the M sigma relation. Now, what's shown is the black hole mass plotted versus the velocity dispersion of the stars of the bulge. At the effective radius, at half the sort of half mass radius, uh, people got very excited because initially uh, it was claimed that the scatter of this M sigma relation was zero. Well, we were too 
optimistic. It's not quite zero, but it's still very small. It's it's 0.28 decks, okay, less than a factor of two. But it's extremely strange. You might think, what's the big deal? Okay? It just means bigger is bigger, okay? Bigger, bigger bulge, bigger black hole. Well, not really. On oh, the x-axis is not the mass. This is the velocity dispersion. There's no size in there. That's weird, right? And moreover, um, you're dealing with time scales that are completely different. The galaxy grows on giga years. Black hole doubles on a saltpeter time scale, 40 million years. The size of the bulge is tens of thousands of light years. The size of the black hole is measured in Schwarzschild units. It's the size of the solar system. Besides, you have galaxies ranging from giant ellipticals to spirals, late type spirals, and have vastly different evolutionary histories. Uh, what on earth are they doing after Hubble trying to line up on a correlation which is almost perfect? Something must be communicating the very big, the whole galaxy with the very small, which is the nucleus. Uh, many ideas have been proposed. Uh, uh, these three papers that I listed at the top, collectively, I looked it up last night, it's kind of amusing, there's uh, 12,000 citations. Uh, many of the early ones were theoretical. The ideas revolved around uh, feedback. The idea is that even though the black hole is just a tiny fraction, half a percent, it's accreting and growing at a significant fraction of the rest mass energy, m dot c squared, 10%, maybe 50% depending on the mass of the black hole, and it releases this energy over a very short time scale, salt kilo time scale. There's so much energy that can easily unbind the interstellar medium of the host galaxy. So when galaxies, especially when they undergo tidal interactions and mergers, the tidal torques drive a large fraction of the gas uh, towards the centers of the, of, the, of the galaxies, especially when they finally merge on, on a second passage. Most of this gas is converted to stars, but a significant fraction, uh, uh, a tiny fraction goes into the black hole and releases so much energy that you can see that the interstellar medium explodes okay just watch there it goes okay uh so the story goes there's so much energy that's released over such a short time scale uh in this case through radiation pressure uh, that you can significantly unbind the cold interstellar medium you shut off star formation you quench the galaxy that is the modern uh lingo uh, turning it red and dead and simultaneously you self-regulate uh, uh the growth of the of the black hole so it's through this coupling between the nucleus and the whole galaxy that we have the concept of uh, black hole galaxy co-evolution, in this case through uh, radiation. A minority of these black holes are even more strange. They release not so much radiation, they release kinetic energy and they impart momentum to the environment, right? Mm -hmm. These radio sources, they squirt out uh, relativistic particles. Uh, this is why it generates synchrotron radiation um, to great size scales, way beyond the galaxy, okay, to the intercostal medium, into their hot envelopes. You can see it directly here in this picture. The blue shows the hot plasma uh, from the Chandra X-ray telescope. The red is the radio emission. You can see that the radio jets create these giant bubbles uh, that's affecting the thermodynamics of the baryons in the halos uh, of these galaxies. Uh, so these ideas of AGN feedback are now completely embedded in the modern lexicon for galaxy evolution. Theorists, either analytically or through numerical simulations, large and small, they insist that you must have AGN feedback. Without it, you have total mess, crisis, catastrophes. Okay, you would otherwise not be able to explain why the Madal plot of star formation versus redshift is basically the same as the uh, quasar uh, uh, evolution of the, of the quasar number density. Apparently, you would not be able to explain why galaxy um, uh, formation, uh, uh, star formation in galaxies is so incredibly inefficient. 
right? 16% uh, of, the, of the of the of the of the of the uh, 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 cosmic density should be in variables. Okay, so if all of that or a significant fraction of that were to be converted to stars, this plot, which is the ratio of the stellar mass to the dark matter, is a function of uh, dark matter uh, uh, halo mass, uh, should peak at 16% or maybe 10%. Okay. But it isn't, okay, the peak is 3%. And that's the peak. If you go to dwarf galaxies, you go to massive galaxies, it's even much, much, much less than, <laughs> than that. Okay, so something is apparently preventing the baryons from cooling efficiently. Uh, uh, so the story goes, well, must, something must be heating it to prevent the cooling from becoming efficient. Galaxies, uh, they don't uh, form stars, you know, randomly. They, they come in basically two flavors. They're either uh, active or they're inactive. They're on or off, okay? So galaxies either reside on the blue cloud or they are dead on the red sequence. Uh, this uh, paper by, by Alvio and India Penn, okay? Uh, why is it that the, uh, the star creation um, activity of galaxies is bimodal? A uh, very popular idea is uh, to invoke AGN feedback uh, to quench galaxies and to keep them quenched, which is even harder. And you can turn it off, and what prevents further cooling that uh, should be happening uh, all the time. Anyway, these ideas, again, as I said, are now pervasive, but they are in textbooks in fun. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what I just told you, the story of supermassive black holes really focused on extremely quiescent present day systems. Uh, by design, because we need them to be inactive so that we can see the stars and, and, and be confident about the gas, but also because they're nearby. These are the nearest galaxies. We need to resolve uh, close enough to the nucleus to be able to get the kinematics. But that's not where feedback happened. It's not when black holes grew. They grew when they were quasars, right? We need to do the same experiment, which is to measure the mass of the black hole when the black hole was active, not when they're inactive. Quasars have two uh, inconvenient features. One is that they're really bright. So you can't see the stars in the bulge okay, very well or at all because you're completely outshined by the central source. Secondly, you can't trust the gas because this, you know, radiation pressure, shocks, you know, God knows what, okay? You can measure velocities, but are you sure it's due to gravity? So, and finally, you can't resolve the sphere of influence of the black hole. They're too far away. They're redshift two or six. That's how I'll show you later in my talk. Twelve. Forget it. <laughs> okay. Nothing will ever resolve them spatially. So we need to resort to a trick. So if you would bear me for a second, maybe this is only of interest to Paula and to Elena. <laughs> Let me explain to you how we estimate the mass of the black hole. I wouldn't be so bold to call it measured. We estimate it. It's very simple. We try to uh, obtain the so-called virial product, right? The product of radius and velocity squared. Uh, if we can do that, then we at least have a virial mass. Now, there's an uncertainty because we don't know the geometry, we don't know the inclination angle, so that's the f, so-called f factor uh, of order unity. Uh, but how do we uh, obtain uh, R and V? Well, let's get V first. That's pretty easy. So we concentrate on quasars. So a cartoon of a quasar has a central black hole. Uh, around it is the hot accretion disk. As I said, the accretion disk produces this blue continuum uh, uh, in, 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 op in optical UV spectra. Around the accretion disk are gas clouds. Okay. Uh, we don't know exactly where they come from, but they're there. Okay, uh, these gas clouds uh, uh, absorb the UV continuum coming from the accretion disk, becomes photoionized, recombines, produces these uh, strong, uh, uh, for example, Balmer lines. These Balmer lines are broad, as I mentioned earlier. So, from the widths of these lines, uh, if we assume that they're due to gravity, uh, that gives us a measure of the velocity. Uh, in this region, which is very, very close to the center. So close that the gravity is dominated by the black hole and not influenced by the surrounding bulge. So V is easy. What's really hard is R. We cannot resolve it. We cannot resolve it in space. Therefore, we resolve it in time. 
uh, accretion onto the black hole, it so happens, is not uh, steady state. It, it's not always the same. It goes up and down, it fluctuates uh, due to instabilities in the disk, due to various environmental effects. So if you look at the accretion disk light curve, which is in red, you can see it goes up and down, up and down, right? Not periodic, it just slips up happily. Because that is what's photoionizing the gas, which is shown in blue, this is the H beta line. You can see the H beta light curve also goes up and down, up and down. Essentially the same pattern. It should, because one is reprocessing the other. But if you have very good eyes, even in the back, right, you can see that the blue curve and the red curve are slightly shifted. There's a lag, a delta T. Okay? Don't use your eyes, do a cross correlation analysis. You can obtain the time delay. And the time delay, very simply, is related to the light travel time. So we know the speed of light, we can measure tau, we can derive r. Okay, it's more complicated than that, but that's roughly the, the cartoon version explanation. Now we can obtain R, okay? So with R and with B squared, we can get the mass. It's not very accurate, it's an estimate, but it's not bad. Uh, it's about uh, factors of two to three, 0.3 to 0.5x. And we can do it basically for all redshifts. At zero redshifts, we can use the optical lines. At high redshift, we can use ultraviolet lines. Uh, not quite as, as accurate, but basically we can estimate masses of black holes. Okay. There's more to the story, but I'll stop at this and just tell you what we can do. One of the things that we can do, and I'm going to focus on the rest of my talk, is to study what are the seeds of the supermassive black holes. What was the first generation supermassive black holes? Uh, down there. This is critical for many reasons. If no other reason, then we want to know how did they grow up to become the really gigantic 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 solar mass objects. Okay. What were these seeds? Let's, for the purpose of discussion, divide the sample into uh, two classes supermassive objects, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 10 solar masses, and the intermediate mass objects, say 10 to the 3 to uh, 10 to the 6 uh, solar mass objects. We know that stars can make low mass black holes, but they are much, much lower mass. Okay? So a star like the sun, of course, will never make a black hole. It will end its life after another five billion years as a, as a white dwarf. Um, but stars more massive than, say, eight times the mass of the sun uh, explode. And uh, depending on whether they are uh, <coughs> massive or very massive, they end their lives as a neutron star or as a stellar mass black hole. This is well known uh, for, for, for a long time that uh, massive stars can make stellar mass black holes. And after LIGO, we actually know quite well now what is the distribution of these uh, stellar mass black holes, right? Uh, uh, the lower limit, of course, is a, a, a few solar masses, but the upper limit is somewhere around 80 solar masses. So very surprising uh, before, before LIGO, but apparently that's, that's, that's what LIGO uh, is suggesting. It can be, uh, uh, about 80 solar masses, maybe 100, okay? but that's about it. This is sort of the upper limit of what uh, 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 stars can, can produce. Uh, but we want to know, can, it, can nature make black holes more massive than 100 solar masses? This is very consequential from the point of view of uh, how to form quasars, because you don't have that much time. You see, black holes cannot grow at arbitrary rates. They're limited by the Eddington rate. Uh, the evolved in time is 40 million years. So whether they start off as 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 is absolutely critical. You want to know what is the lowest mass that galactic nuclei can have. Of course, we're also interested in what we ionize the universe and many other more cosmological questions. Uh, so are the seeds light from population three stars, in which case they would have masses of, say, uh, tens, less than 100 solar masses, or are they heavy, um, as would occur from the direct collapse um, of, of gas clouds? You see, very early in the universe, the metallicities were very low, zero, okay? uh, almost zero. Cooling is extremely inefficient, 
fragmentation is prevented uh, or not conducive to fragmentation and massive clouds apparently uh, theorists say can directly collapse to make seeds of 100,000 or 10,000 solar clusters. But this is what theorists can imagine in their computers and in their heads. Uh, until very recently, we have no uh, observational evidence to test whether this is true or not. Before I tell you the latest update of why I think we've solved this problem, let me go back a little bit and uh, I'll show you some other evidence before JWST. So for many years, since my PhD, I've been thinking about this question. Are there these intermediate mass black holes in the local universe? Okay, forget about the high redshift universe. I can't go there. There's no JWST at the time. In the local universe, if they are, where are they? How would you find them? Don't bother looking here. The massive early type galaxies have a bulge. We already know from the Hubble work I described that all of them have black holes. They follow the M sigma relation, right? All of them, 100%. If any actually exists, they would be here among the more numerous, low mass, late type, bulgeous galaxies. But we had no idea if they exist. How would you find them? You cannot find them by directly resolving them with kinematics. Okay, because their black holes are too small, the sphere of influence is too tiny, even with Hubble, there's no hope of actually resolving them. Instead, let's ask a much simpler question, which is, do we find evidence of AGNs, or little tiny quasars in these small galaxies? That's an easier question to, to, to address. To the extent that quasars and AGNs come from uh, accretion onto a black hole, this is a very effective even if it's a blunt instrument to detect these objects. I knew that there were some. In fact, this was one of the key results of my PhD thesis. Uh, it's a deep spectroscopic survey before SDSS of 500 bright galaxies. We spent 140 dark nights on the 5 meter telescope at Kalamar, which is the largest telescope at the time. And early type galaxies, of a very high fraction of AGMs, 60, 75%, completely consistent with the HST result that 100% of the black holes, it's a lower limit of course, with the occupation fraction of black holes. But the, the, the incidence of AGMs in, in late type galaxies, these SC, SD, SM, these bulgeless spiral galaxies, is not zero. It's about 15%, 10 to 20%. Okay, here are the two uh, prototypes that I love, uh, worked on the most uh, using the Keck telescopes. NGC 4395 on the, on the upper panel is a magnetic spiral galaxy, zero bulge. You can see this thing is hardly visible, such low surface brightness, okay? but it has a tiny little quasar in the center. Look at the spectrum. It's just like 3C273, but this thing is seven orders of magnitude less luminous than 3C273. It has a radio core, it has x rays, it has all the juicy things you expect in a self, you know, in, in an active black nucleus. It's a black hole mass estimated to be 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 solar masses. Hox 52, uh, originally discovered by Clinton and Sargent, uh, is even more extreme. It's a dwarf galaxy. Uh, uh, John Cormody would be very upset if I called it a dwarf uh, elliptical, so I'll call it a spiral. Okay, <laughs> he insists you should not call these things ellipticals. Uh, uh, it's only a kiloparsec across 10 to the 5 solar masses. Two, well, two is better than one, and one is better than zero because it proves as a principle right, that nature can make these things. But you cannot make a science out of one or two objects. Thank you very much, SDSS 2004, early data release, 500,000 spectra, not 500, but 500,000. Now we're talking, right? And the spectra are not bad. Look at them, right? They're really, you know, good enough for me to search for 
broad emission lines, this characteristic signature from the this uh, uh, mini quasar. Okay? And we found many of these things. Uh, most of the work was done by uh, Jenny Green, shown here at the time. She was a graduate student from Harvard who came to Carnegie uh, to work with me. And uh, she wrote um, arguably one of the most influential PhD theses in the last 20 years, uh, uh, which is summarized here. Okay? Uh, basically, she found several hundred more such objects. So we went from two to a few hundred. Um, people were very excited about these results, so much so that uh, she got a faculty position before she defended her PhD as a UT Austin. Um, and then first year of her postdoc, MIT tried to hire her, uh, but too late, uh, Princeton uh, grabbed her. <laughs> uh, why are so, they so interested in this? Well, I'll tell you later. Uh, the gravitational wave community is very interested in this object. But we didn't just find these things, we did lots of follow up. The most important follow up was with the Hubble Space Telescope. We imaged all of them, nearly all of them. Out of hundreds of these objects, we only found one that had a bulge. It's right there in the upper left. Only one. The others are dwarf galaxies. Late type galaxies, very late type galaxies, completely bulgeless galaxies. Okay, so 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar mass black holes in these very tiny, I call them underdeveloped galaxies. Do not be fooled just because these objects are blue and found in the nearby universe that they were formed yesterday. They contain stars as old as the oldest stars in the universe who were formed as early as the earliest galaxies in the universe. The reason that they are underdeveloped is because they are lucky or unlucky to have escaped the merger tree. They, they, they didn't get incorporated and eaten by big galaxies. So they're basically fossil records. The galaxies are fossil records of they've imprinted their formation conditions. And if they have a black hole in the center, as I say, they do. Those black holes are also a wonderful fossil record of their early conditions. This is the reason that the sample is important. Uh, but that's just the optical. We can't find these objects unless they're creating nearly the maximum Eddington rate, okay? because they are intrinsically uh, low mass, therefore, even if they're shining like crazy, they're still not very luminous because there's an Eddington limit. So instead of the optical, a very efficient, much better way is to go to the X-rays. Chandra. Why? Because Chandra is an amazing energy filter. Okay, so here's a nearby galaxy. In the optical, it looks beautiful. Spiral arms, dust lanes, you know, H2 regions, all this gorgeous things, right? But that's bad. If you want to find something really faint in this giant mess, right? That's really, really bad because you don't know where to look. But the same galaxy with Chandra looks like the left object. You see, all the stars have disappeared, except for the X-ray binaries. And then the thing in the center, which is the creating black hole. With just two kiloseconds with Chandra, you can obtain this result. Okay, which is a tiny, tiny uh, amount of observing time. Okay, so, so we did that using the Chandra uh, X-ray satellite over a series of uh, years. We've accumulated roughly 2,000 objects, and we found this population of late-type galaxies. Take a look at these, but they no bulge. Uh, some of them are dwarfs, but they have this X-ray nucleus, this X-ray nucleus, which cannot be explained by stellar phenomena. They're not X-ray binaries. They're not low-mass, high-mass X-ray, not supernova remnants, not pulsar wind nebula, okay? Uh, uh, they are coming from accretion onto a low mass point. How many? 50%. At least 50%. So this is a conclusion from the annual review we published three years ago uh, with, with Jenny. Uh, 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 6 solar mass black holes in post galaxies below 10 to the 10 solar masses. Optimization fraction is at least 50%. That's a lot. Remember, the occupation fraction for massive galaxies is 
Unfortunately, we could not distinguish whether they come from light seeds or heavy seeds, these two channels okay, uh, at the time. Okay. But at least we've answered this basic question I had posed just a moment ago. Do they exist? The answer is yes. Where are they? They are in these small, late type, underdeveloped galaxies. Okay, this is where the situation stood before the launch of JWS. Okay. Now we're very interested in what's happening in high redshift. My colleagues, especially in China, have been trying to push this, 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 you know, go to redshift six, maybe go higher after many years okay, of effort, you know, sifting through the entire sky using clever, you know, color selection techniques. Okay. Uh, they find, you know, special objects like this one. Uh, 10 to the 10 solar masses, the redshift 6.3. Really shocking. The universe was less than a billion years old. How did they form 10 billion solar mass uh, black hole? Just three years ago, another record holder, 7.6, already 10 to the 9 solar masses. So it became already very critical, okay, more and more so because we're finding really massive black holes earlier and earlier in the universe. Well, now I'm going to update you on something even more spectacular, which is now we can push all the way deep into the epoch of realization, down back to the cosmic dawn, wretched uh, 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 10 or even higher, okay? Uh, I think we've cracked the, the problem, but mostly have uh, made a very, uh, 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 important advance in this, in this problem. It's all due to the James Webb Space Telescope. What are we talking about? Even if you don't work in this subject, surely you should have seen these papers on astral pH. And uh, I assure you, this is only about 20% of the papers that have appeared in the last six months. Most of these are just preprints. Not one, one or two have been published, but none of these have even been accepted yet. And you can see from the title, people are just very excited, right? <laughs> just read the title, you know? Uh, extreme, 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 okay? really early. Like, oh my God, what's happening? <laughs> what are they talking about? Let me introduce you to Little Red Dots. So in the background here, let me show you again. This is uh, uh, one of the deep fields from, from, from the Jacob Space Telescope, uh, several filters in the rest brain, uh, UV and optical. There's a population of objects that are now called little red dots. And I'll try to convince you that these are the progenitors of quasars. These are the sea black holes we've been looking for. This is what they look like. Little, and red. They literally are a dot. What do I mean by that? They have sizes, physical sizes, less than 50 plus. In a few cases, magnified by gravitational lensing, less than 30 parsecs. Okay. Less than because they're unresolved. Often there's no sign whatsoever of any underlying galaxy. Do you see a galaxy? I sure don't. They have really weird uh, spectral energy distributions. It's a V shape. You see, there's a red component in the rest frame optical that's rising. And then abruptly at 4,000 angstrom, there's a blue component that's rising towards the rest frame uh, ultraviolet. Very characteristic, very uniform V shape. Okay. Uh, I think that tells us there are two components, right? There's something that's going this way and nothing that's going this way. Uh, all of the papers so far have interpreted this as to be a signature of an obscure quasar. So the optical, the, the fact that it's red is because it's highly reddened by dust. And that the uh, blue is very likely to be scattered light. So it's the, it's the quasar in the center, which is blue. But it's escaping because there are some holes, right? Uh, the dust is not 100% covering. Uh, and through uh, uh, reflection, for example, by uh, electrons, uh, okay, we see a, a 
few percent of the energy comes out of this scattered light. For the aficionados, uh, maybe only a couple in the audience, the x-rays are intrinsically weak. I disagree with this interpretation. I told people um, this morning, okay, I do not believe this is due to dust over scattering because dust and scattering is an accident. <laughs> A little bit, a lot, a tiny bit, you know, there should be a large dispersion of redness. Scattering is a random process, okay? Okay, okay. Um, you may have reflectors, you may not, okay. I do not think that you can produce such a uniform spectral energy distribution. I think this is intrinsic. This is a signature of something we've never seen before. How do we know they're AGMs? Well, 80% of them for which spectra have been taken look like AGMs. The other 20% are brown dwarfs. So the success rate is incredibly high. Okay, they have spectra, like, like showed you earlier, like 3C273, okay, these broad uh, uh, permitted lines. Thousands of kilometers per second, black hole masses of 10 to 6, 10 to 8 solar masses, they're creating a significant fraction of the Eddington rate, and they have extremely low gas phase in the system. 10% or even less. They're really abundant. Shockingly abundant. How abundant? Compared to the extrapolated luminosity function of quasars, they're at least 100 times more abundant. Okay, the green line here uh, is the extrapolated UV luminosity function of quasars. The little red dots are the little red dots. 100 times. They're approaching the total luminosity function of galaxies, which is the blue line. Depending on which study that you're looking at, it's either a few percent or 10% of all galaxies. Now, these are the ones we've detected that have broad emission lines, okay? There must be those that are obscure that we don't see as broad emission lines. They're, they're for the aficionados uh, type two, okay? This is basically telling you that Nearly all <laughs> galaxies at these early epochs have black holes. But why are you surprised? I told you at low redshift, 100% of massive galaxies have black holes, and at least 50% of low mass galaxies even have black holes. They have to start somewhere. If not now, then when? We're witnessing the birth of the black holes. We I showed you about earlier from HST in Chandra. Okay. But unlike the local black holes, which obey these tight scaling relations I told you about, the black holes are overmassive, way overmassive. Okay, let me remind you for the inactive galaxies, the inactive black holes, right, they follow this Magorian relation, this M sigma relation. The mass fraction is 0.005. 0.5% with a very tiny scatter of 0.3 dex. This is for inactive local black holes. For active local black holes, that is AGNs that are nearby, there's a similar result. Okay. Uh, it's kind of complicated, but basically the relation and the scaling is similar to uh, inactive black holes. The scatter is bigger because it's you know more uncertain. Okay? But basically, there's no systematic deviation. The math ratio is still 0.5%. Surprise, this is a situation of high redshift. Okay, so the local relation is this blue line in the lower right, and all of those points from various studies that are coming in every day, okay, every week, deviate by factors of 10, 100, or more. Why do I say more? Because I remind you, I don't see any galaxy. Do you see a galaxy there? So what are you talking about in terms of the mass of the host galaxy? That's a lower limit. It's very obvious, isn't it? That the black hole formed first, or at least faster than the stars. This is bad news for people who insist on coevolution 
and AGMP back and that nice story I showed you earlier. It's not happening here. Okay. What are you talking about? Okay. The black hole came first, a lot first. Okay. And now I think we've basically cracked this problem. Right? The classic puzzle of how do you make the 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 solar mass black holes so early? Light seeds or heavy seeds? There is, if it's light seeds from 100 solar mass black holes, in order to get up there, the redshift six and seven quasars, you have to accrete at super Eddington rates, and you need to continuously accrete at super Eddington rates. Otherwise, you can never get up there, 100 solar mass. That's really hard continuously for several hundred million years and nonstop, right? Forget about feedback and environmental, whatever, okay? How do you arrange that, okay? But if you start off with 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar masses um, with these so called massive heavy seeds, then you can sort of, you know, casually wander up there, okay? Uh, you don't need some adding to the dates and you don't need it to be continuous, it can be episodic. But that's exactly what we just found. Here is the redshift 9. 10 to the 7 solar mass black hole right here, okay? Right? If it start off at, you know, 10 to the 5 solar masses, no problem. You can get up there. Okay. Again, if it's a light seed, you would have to go up there at super Eddington rates much, much earlier. But isn't this what you expect if it's a if the black hole came first, okay, so this is uh, again the black hole mass versus galaxy mass correlation. This is this redshift nine object, this right up here. But it's just one of the many objects up here. This entire class of objects behave in this way. I think we just found a smoking gun for the red collapse. I see no other way to explain this. It's very obvious if it's if the black hole came first. And completely essentially independent of the of the of, of, of the stars and galaxies, and it would overshoot. Of course, it would overshoot. Why would it care? Okay. Uh, so is it the chicken or the egg? I think it's the egg. <laughs> but let's go further. Let me let, please ex look at this picture and think about it. Okay. The size of this source is less than thirty parsecs. 30 parsecs. For those of you who know anything about stellar astronomy, okay, that's less than the size of an OB association. That's a, a third of the size of a giant molecular cloud. That's an upper limit. Are you sure there's a galaxy? Are you sure there are any stars in here? It's a serious question, okay? I'm really, really excited by this. Okay? I, I, I hope you can tell I'm really excited. I haven't slept in uh, many days okay, because of, of these results. Okay? Uh, it's very rare that you know you find something. You know, theorists thought about it but for decades, uh, these heavy seeds, but that was just in their imagination. But I think we're looking at it. Uh, now, if all of these large galaxies have black holes and the little galaxies, many, many of them have black holes or all of them have black holes, when they merge, which of course they will, what's going to happen? Well, of course, they're going to form uh, pairs. The galaxies will merge, the black holes in them will merge, the mass ratio of these binaries will be extremely unequal. 10 to 1, 100 to 1, 1,000 to 1, even, perhaps even more extreme. Uh, it's going to generate gravitational waves, not in the LIGO band, but in the LISA band. And there's uh, two Chinese missions, Haiji and Tianjin, which is the counterpart of LISA, that are also uh, uh, in the works. And depending on the mass ratio, pulsar timing. All right. You know how it works, right? Pulsars are you know, millisecond, you know, ultra precise clocks. If a wave comes by, it jiggles it. So you look at the perturbation to the arrival time of pulsar signal. If you have multiple uh, pulsars, you can triangulate and get the, the direction. Uh, this is not fantasy land. Uh, this is happening right now. In fact, 
Uh, Europeans have been doing it for 20 years, the International Pulsar Timing Array. Uh, the US has been doing the nanograph experiment in China for just the last three years. We've been doing the largest radium telescope in the world. It's called FAST, 500 meters. And they have a 4.6 sigma signal. 4.6 sigma. They have a very, you know, lots of discipline. They don't want to call it detection. <laughs> Apparently, they've agreed they need to wait until seven sigma for any team to declare victory. Yeah. Uh, I think this is incredibly exciting. This is the uh, integrated, uh, uh, it's not individual object. They can get that in the future, but this is the, 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 uh, the stochastic background of uh, massive black hole binaries. Uh, uh, I hesitate to say they've been detected, but basically it's, 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 it's nearly detected. Okay, for the future, there are many space missions. You know, China is uh, ambitious and rapidly developing. It's already uh, launched uh, several payloads to construct the Chinese space station. This is 600 kilometer low Earth orbit. There's a permanent crew of three to five uh, astronauts who live up there. Uh, they have lots of things to do, but uh, one of the things is to service the space telescope, which will be flying in the same orbit, not attached, but on the same orbit as the space station. This is a CSST, the Chinese uh, Space Station uh, Telescope. It's two meters, just like Hubble, but unlike Hubble, it has a giant camera, 350 times the collect the the the, the field of view, uh, seven filters uh, with a uh, grism spectroscopy will fly for 10 to 15 years to survey 18,000 square degrees of the sky. Uh, it will deliver pictures like this that you're familiar with from HST but for billions of galaxies, for very well resolved, you know, like pretty galaxies, many, many millions. You think about SDSS, that's two million ground-based images, right? That's just 10,000 square degrees, okay? So uh, it's gonna have this type of data. Uh, I'm very happy that I managed to convince some bureaucrats that <laughs> there should be a science center, just like, HST has STSCI, you know, attached to James uh, Johns Hopkins Global Science Center, uh, uh, attached to the Kavli Institute. Uh, so we will be the science center uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the space telescope. Uh, it's operating in the near UB, 2,500 inches to one micron, and then Euclid and uh, Roman will pick up for as long as we can. Spectacular. We'll have data for decades. Yeah, okay. all your little uh, uh, jellyfish, okay, <laughs> gonna be there, okay? Uh, okay, let me finish. Uh, so I give you a very uh, a big tour, I'm sorry, I'm taking a bit of time. Uh, we've uh, 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 discovered over the last uh, two and a half decades that central black holes are a fundamental constituent uh, of galaxies. They're, 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 they're in all, nearly all galaxies, okay? Uh, they co-evolve with galaxies. Um, from the scaling relations I've introduced and the energy and that they release uh, through feedback uh, uh, may be very important for regulating uh, uh, galaxy uh, evolution. 100% uh, of massive galaxies uh, have supermassive black holes, 10 to 6, 10 to 10 solar masses. Uh, at least half of low mass galaxies have uh, intermediate mass black holes, 10 to 4 to 10 to 6 solar masses. We've known for a long time that quasars with very massive black holes into the ninth and the ten solar masses were present at the redshift six and higher, when the universe was less than a giga year old. What's really new and exciting is that James Webb has now uh, discovered a huge population of less massive black holes, ten to the six, ten to the eight solar masses, uh, with redshifts up to eleven. I think this uh, importance uh, offers a uh, very important uh, new constraints on the formation uh, mechanism um, of, of supermassive black holes. We have to rethink about their contribution to the cosmic uh, reionization. Okay, my colleague and I two years ago said it was less than seven percent. No, <laughs> okay, okay, that has to be revised. Okay, we have to also revise the fact they have different spectra. A lot of them, and they have this you know, weird, crazy spectrum. And of course, gravitational wave astrophysics um, uh, is very, very uh, promising. Um, 
So uh, for the students uh, in the audience, uh, in case uh, you were not taking notes fast enough, uh, I would recommend uh, three annual reviews articles. Uh, two of them are quite old, but they're still useful. Uh, almost everything in them are still valid. Um, the James Webb stuff is on the archives. Thank you very much. This spectacular talk. Do you have any question here? Do we have a microphone? Any questions? I shall start. Sure, please, Duncan. Thanks. Okay. So, if we can't even measure this, the masses of these objects, how do you put them on the main plot? I mean, there were several points above the pressure zero relation, but how, how do you place them? How are the masses estimated? Let's just say very crudely, uh, they're, they're not my favorite. <laughs> uh, but I think they're qualitatively correct. I mean, they're so extreme. So if they're lower limit. I think they're so they're even more extreme than they appear. As I said, you can look at those little red dots. I see nothing. And those are really, really deep images. Okay. So, so whatever is underneath there is at least as extreme as what's shown. I think that's what's exciting. So I think we need to, there are better techniques to, to, to do the analysis. I, I, don't, I don't have time uh, to, to, to discuss it here. Okay? Uh, and we're trying to improve, but I don't think this picture is going to fundamentally change in a qualitative sense. I do. And just related to the same question that uh, Bianca was asking, I think the, the masses are derived from two observables. One is a luminosity and a line width, and which is a relation that is well established locally. So my question is, how sure are we that the same relation holds true also on redshift uh, 10? That's an excellent question. And let me uh, answer it also. Uh, uh, Amplify uh, my, my uh, reply to, to Bianca's question. I thought she was asking about the galaxy. So there are two things, right? It's the, it's the mass of the black hole divided by the mass of the galaxy. I think the mass of the galaxy is at least as low as what is shown here because I don't even see it. So that was my reply about the galaxy. Uh, that involves uh, better image analysis, SCD fitting, uh, you know, gal fit, blah, blah, blah. Okay. The mass of the black hole, Albio is correct, uh, and Helena is, is an expert. We use the local uh, relations of calibrated by local EGMs. Um, of course, uh, we, 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 we can't be certain uh, that they, they apply uh, uh, accurately. But I would say that you can do something really dumb, like just take the luminosity. Yeah, we can't get that wrong. We have the redshift, we have the flux going. It's very large, 10 to the 45 words per second. Okay, uh, so you can get a lower limit on the mass of the black hole if the Eddington limit is even roughly right. That's still a big mass. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of very extreme cases I didn't point out. It's a much of 10.6, 10.6. You know, it has like 10 to the 45 words in X rays. Okay, you know, so. If it's not, I was discussing this this morning, okay? If this is not a black hole of significant mass, then you better come up with an even more exotic alternative. You know, this, what kind of stars can do this, okay? Uh, what kind of stars will have uh, this type of luminosity in this tiny volume, have this type of spectrum? Okay? Um, we're busy trying to determine if they vary. I think that's a very crucial and simple measure. Do they show variability? If they do, it's almost certainly it's a black hole or some kind there because it cannot be a cluster of you know incoherent sources. Okay. Uh, so uh, I, I know that the, the masses need to be improved and it may be very hard to do so, but it is very, very difficult to to, to fundamentally change this picture. I have just a very simple question. Um, 
as a, as a, a community of scientists, we tend to be very conservative, uh, as we were commenting before, with our methods uh, and our observations and our assumptions. Now that uh, by accident we see new things, uh, are there some simulations or observations you would do out of the average things we do that maybe could point us to the explanation of what we are seeing? So, as I just uh, 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 implied, uh, 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 I still want to be cautious. People have asked me, are you sure that these are not more galaxies and brought each other? Are you sure these are not some kind of weird supernova? Okay. Uh, uh, um, uh, if they are, they would be unprecedented <laughs> because they don't have the spectrum. You know, but but let's 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 be open minded, right? So 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 we have to proceed one step at a time. Uh, as I just mentioned, I think getting the light curves would be a very important uh, uh, next step. Okay, uh, understanding the full spectrum. I just highlighted the H alpha line, but what it didn't show is that the spectrum is so good. You have lots of lines. You know, not just one broad line. You have H. You know, you have everything. You have you have nitrogen, carbon, <laughs> okay? It really does look like a quasar, okay? Uh, so the, the question then really, if, if it's really a quasar, then are you sure about the masses? Of course, I'm not sure. <laughs> so <laughs> that's uh, what, 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 what for the future. Uh, uh, theoretically, I think that's even, you know, more of a challenge, okay? Because previously people made these numerical simulations have done these back of the envelope uh, estimates of, uh, heavy sea, but I don't think they were, you know, I, I, I don't think anybody really thought that these objects uh, uh, so quickly and with such uh, high abundance. Maybe I didn't emphasize the point uh, uh, strong enough. The SEERs, uh, JWST, the various uh, deep fields, they're really tiny fields. There are now hundreds of these little red dots. 80% of them have spectral, like, like I showed you. You know, my colleagues and others, they've spent decades to find, you know, one redshift seven quasar all over the sky. Okay, so this is not a joke. These things are really there. And some of them are amplified by clusters. By, by design, these experiments, right? They're everywhere. Okay, so 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 uh, so whatever they are, this is a very important uh, new phenomenon. So I think the the theorists, I think, are really busy uh, uh, going back to their drawing boards. I think they should do uh, uh, more up to date uh, numerical simulations. They're relatively easy compared to galaxies. You know, it's gas, you know, they're, they're metal free clouds, and you know, but they have to. The advantage they have now is that they have data to compare them with. So this is not an imaginary population of objects. They need to confront the data that are emerging nearly on a weekly basis from JWST. Um, so I think we're going to have a very exciting, um, you know, a uh, few years or even few months. <laughs> I told you all these papers, the vast majority of them are not even accepted yet. They're all in the archive. People are so busy just, you know, showing us what they found. I don't know if Alessandro from the other room can point me to some questions from the Zoom community. I can let There you... are no questions right now. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. Just a question. Do you think that Chandra would be more chance and useful to study in the class of objects from this case? Do you think that the exhibition of Chandra would be a problem? So the good news is that uh, Chandra has already studied these uh, objects because uh, the JWST deep fields were by design chosen to be the deepest uh, Chandra fields. And I went over it very quickly. Um, the, the, the point is that if these are regular quasars, they would have been detected, but they're not, except for one object. Okay? They're, they're, None of them have X-ray detections or even stacked, you know, okay, so to very, very deep limits. They have uh, extremely weak uh, uh, X-rays. On the surface of it, that might seem to contradict the fact that these are, you know, 
NASA black holes. But in fact, uh, uh, they're not. Uh, so there's a class of um, AGNs uh, uh, known as uh, X-ray weak, X-ray weak uh, quasars. These are intrinsically X-ray weak. Um, uh, they are thought to come from um, highly accreting black holes, very even super Eddington black holes. It's a very um, uh, technical subject, okay? But basically, it's a signature of uh, super editing accretion. So that if that's true, then uh, this is in fact what you expect if these objects are, um, you know, growing really, really quickly. Uh, so, so, so the Chandra observations are already um, very constraining. Um, regardless of that, it would be a pity for them to decommissioning it because uh, uh, clearly there's a lot more that can still be done. Would that exhaust the, the, the low mass seeds? I'm sorry? Would that, the fact that uh, if they are meeting super mm -hmm, mm -hmm. would this uh, resuscitate the option of uh, low mass seeds? Uh, only a little bit, in the sense that for the low mass seeds, they need to be super Eddington continuously mm -hmm. for, uh, you know, three to 400 million years. But these objects, if they are all the same, Um, so technically you're, you're, you're right. Okay. If they're low, so, so technically there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no logical uh, contradiction yet. Uh, it's just that, uh, you know, the experts who, who study the formation of these objects say it's incredibly difficult for them to be, to maintain super editing continuously because there's feedback, um, 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 I don't think that's necessarily a very uh, strong argument just because I'm intrinsically suspicious of a lot of numerical simulations. Um, um, I think the stronger argument are the overmassive nature of these black holes, I told you. you know, In any of the low mass uh, uh, seed scenarios, I expect the stars to be formed first and then you know, like a dense cluster or something like that, right? Uh, it's very weird that I don't see the stars. So that, that's that's what drives me to think that these are direct collapse uh, black holes. But it but it's a but it's, it's it's not a rigorous argument. It's just a physical hunch that I have. Question. Thanks for your wonderful presentation. So the first question is uh, regarding you are talking about the estimation for the supermax sample and relates to the red broad line region. So in this case, could be a possible bias to the broad light AGN. Because uh, such as some, some class of the AGN, such as the Viana object, they even have the, the clear or maybe significant broad light region. Maybe we didn't see this kind of the broad light region. So when you discuss of this correlation, so when you use the broad light region to discuss the supermax cycle, so maybe could be a possible a bias that like maybe is more uh, biased to the fault line AGN. Uh, you consider the maybe the big maybe the big line or maybe the narrow line uh, AGN. Uh, so you're absolutely right that we are by selection, you know, targeting the objects that are have have, have broad lines. Uh, but we know from you know decades of study since uh, 1980s, right? Um, that for every broadline AGN, there's there's uh, two to four times as many uh, narrow line AGNs just because of orientation, the so-called type two versus type one AGNs. Okay. Um, uh, fundamentally, there's nothing uh, wrong with that picture. That picture has been uh, validated for uh, for decades already. Okay. So 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 simply in the objects that lack broad lines, we just don't use them, <laughs> okay? Uh, but it doesn't mean that they don't have uh, black holes because they, they, just, they, they just don't show the broad line signature to enable you to use this method. Um, 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 uh, to be a, a bit uh, less evasive, uh, let me say that uh, I think the future is incredibly exciting uh, in Europe because of gravity. If you don't know what gravity is, uh, you should go Google it. Uh, it's the most amazing uh, instrument uh, ever designed for a ground-based telescope. 
that combines the light from the four VLTs um, as an interferometer. Um, its first spectacular application was to measure the mass of the black hole in the first quasar, 3C273. Uh, uh, and, and the black hole mass it obtained by directly resolving the gas in the, in the broad line region almost exactly matches the reverberation mapping uh, black hole mass okay, from the broad lines. And the latest salvo, which is a paper that just came out in Nature, is that they've extended this to redshift 2.5 with uh, gravity plus. Okay. Um, I'm told that uh, they have uh, several more they haven't yet published. Um, but there's no reason to restrict to quasars. Okay. You know, if you can find a suitable um, uh, 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 SAR to, to, to correct uh, the, the, the AO uh, uh, wavefront. Okay. You can do this for any, any, any galaxy, including normal galaxies, including uh, uh, type 2 AGNs. Um, um, you know, uh, not just a redshift 2, you can go even higher because of the angular size versus redshift relation. But you don't, you don't lose in physical resolution as you go to higher redshift. Okay. Of course, you're just limited by the number of photons. Things are just fainter. And so, so I think in the very near future, uh, 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 you can actually do this direct black hole mass measurements by resolving the kinematics, um, even for uh, high redshift uh, objects. Okay. So that that's to be done, but that, that's that's promising. <laughs> Wonderful question. Um, I told you the little red dots are a uh, hundred times more uh, abundant than quasars. So clearly, most of them do not evolve into quasars. Only 1% of the little red dots will become quasars. But which and why? <laughs> Maybe the ones that are most clustered because they live in the densest environments, you know, the, the proto clusters of the future. Okay. So this, I think, can be subtle um, uh, as we get, you know, more spectra and more uh, redshifts. I, I, I think in the not too distant future, you can attempt clustering analysis, for example, to, right? To, that would be a way to, to distinguish, uh, to get to estimate the, the halo masses. Uh, also just from the direct imaging to, to characterize the environment, you know, its neighbors. Okay? So all of this is yet to be done. Uh, but I think that's a very logical, a very important question. The vast majority of them would become today's uh, Milky Way and M31 and so forth, the, today's CFIT galaxies, but only a tiny fraction, maybe 1% are the progenitors of quasars. But which, which, which 1% and why? <laughs> I would thank again, Professor Ho, and we hope to have you. <laughs>